Sing to this October song, no song for it. The words that you When did it all begin for me? Really, was it before? When did it begin? It's the question. Does it begin now? Did it begin then? Will it begin? Did it begin when I first read the Communist Manifesto and Marx said, at a crucial point of the revolutionary progress, a section of the bourgeois intellectuals split off and joined the working class? Did it begin then? That's what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said to myself. I want to be one of them. I love that idea that I will be one of those bourgeois intellectuals who split off and go over to the working class. And I knew what the working class was. I knew because I'd seen it with my own eyes in the north of England. And I knew I wasn't one of them. And I knew I was a bourgeois intellectual. I knew that very early in life. I knew I was a faggy bourgeois intellectual. That's what I knew. And I would split off and go over to the working class and help them think, long live the dictatorship of the proletariat. It takes a kind of effort. It takes a kind of persistence. One has to just carry on, carry on, carry on. So what position to speak in? Where can I speak from? When did it begin? Maybe it began somewhere else. Maybe, maybe it began when, just two years ago, and I heard Chiara Fumai talking in Zurich, the late lamented Chiara Fumai, and I realized I was right to scream! when I began my lectures. Why shouldn't I scream? I didn't want to scream from anguish. I wanted to scream to split the sensible, to change, to change the way in which people stand at platforms and nicely speak and say, today I want to tell you about Derek Charman's blue and the space of gay being. No, no. I heard a hundred lectures begin that. I thought, I don't want that. I don't want to be that anymore. I've done it all my life. I've written my... I want to scream! But also I want to... And no sound to come out at all. Those are all ways it could proceed. But where did it begin? Did it begin with the Paris Commune? Did it begin like Lenin said? The Paris Commune was spontaneous. Was I spontaneous? Could I be like the Paris Commune? I don't know if I look on the floor here. The Paris Communes. Here it is. Here's, here's Lenin talking... You can see it, Lenin is talking to the, he's talking to the Russian people about the Paris Commune. Here, here, here are the communards, an anarchist print, and they're, they're, or are they the communards? There are some communards too, they're, they're, they're what you call in French the poor buggers, they're bending over their ca cannons, they're going to be slaughtered in their thousands, and I thought I knew them when I saw these images that I wanted to work for them. I would go over to the working class, I would do what Marx said, I would split off, I'd go over to the working class, I'd throw over all, all the art I loved, all the art I loved, and I'd throw over all the art I loved, and, but, but, I love Warren Beatty. I love Reed and the Revolution. I love his book on the Russian Revolution. I'd like to be Warren Beatty playing. Gorky recorded Lenin's very characteristic works, spoken after he listened to Beethoven's Appassionata Sonata. I know the Appassionata inside out, and yet I'm willing to listen to it every day. It is wonderful, ethereal music. On hearing it, I proudly, maybe somewhat naively think, see, the people are able to produce such marvels. Then he winked and laughed and added, but I'm often unable to listen to music. It gets on my nerves. Sorry. It gets on my nerves. I would like to stroke my fellow beings and whisper street, sweet nothings in their ears to be able to produce such beautiful things in spite of the abominable hell they are living in. However, today one shouldn't caress anybody, for people only bite off your hand, strike without pity. Though theoretically, we're up against any kind of violence. Oomph! In fact, it is an infernally difficult task. That's what Gorky wrote about Lenin. Gorky, a writer I much love. And, but I knew when I read that by Marx, that we'll split off and go over and 
join the working class, that we'd be torn. Torn in half, torn in pieces. We'd be torn in such a way that we're bound to become the class traitors. We're bound to become the running dogs of capitalism. We're bound to become the people Stalin denies as the seedy bourgeois elements. And I went through all that again in my Maoist days. I went through that again in my Maoist days. And I struck poses I learned from Lenin. I stood in an election and I studied Soviet socialist realist painting very, very carefully to see how to do it and how Lenin stood it. You know, you Long live the Communist Party of England, Marxist Leninists. Long live the proletariat of Portsmouth South. And those the elections, circumscription. And you know, when you went to see the workers in their houses, when you did what we call mass work, because we long live the great October Socialist Revolution. Long live Comrade Enja Hodja. Long live Naxal Bari. We knew all those slogans, and we knew their histories, we knew their meanings, and we shouted them, and we rushed the police, shouting them one after another. The police didn't care. They charged us back and threw us over the wall. Long live death too. Long live death too. We shouted and we loved that shouting. We loved it. It was important and we thought it would bring about change. And maybe it did. Maybe not the change we thought. Maybe not the change we saw. But we lived in it and for it and we lived on. Maybe that's good enough. I loved the Paris Commune. I loved it. So maybe it did begin there, or maybe it began just before it. I'm sorry, I like Bernini too. I love Bernini. So all the time thinking about being a running dog, long live, how, no, you it's very hard. It's very hard. I love Bernini, or would I be the angel? No, no, St. Teresa. Long live Comrade Mao. Long live Comrade Stalin. Long live Marx, long live, long live. Oh. You see, you can't just leave it behind. It lives with you. It teaches you how to say things. It teaches you how to speak. It teaches you how to be distracted from the revolution. So even when you stand there like this with the people in front of you who are going to vote for you, and you carefully adopt Lenin's pose, or maybe that pose, or maybe the Lenin with a cap or the Lenin without a cap, I want to do that again. Can I do it better this time? You see, she's got all those props. I have nothing. <laughs> you see what I mean? So maybe it began here. Cherry time. Just before the Paris Commune. Songwriter writes cherry time. A love song. I love love songs. I love the Paris Commune. I love love songs that precede the Paris Commune. I love love songs that precede the Paris Commune and by some mistake of history become songs of the Paris Commune and fly around the world. Very tight. Baptiste Clément. I love technology too. I like the technology of clicking, of hand cranking, of showing works for the first time, of hearing them for the first time. Maybe in older technologies, maybe I'm just sentimental, maybe that's all I want out of the Russian Revolution and the Paris Commune is another chance to sink into petty bourgeois sentimentality. Let's see. Oh, that's important, that's an important. It could be that it began or ended there. Look, that's President Brezhnev, first Communist Party Secretary President Brezhnev in 1964, probably the first photograph of him to be issued in Life magazine. And I was a bourgeois student studying in a very bourgeois university with an even more bourgeois tutor who was my politics tutor. And this is a true story. A lot of the stories I tell you are true stories. They're from life, so you can believe them. You can believe them, you can believe in them. And my tutor was very excited, and he came rushing out of his study when I was about to go in for my evening tutorial. He said, Rifkin! Come here, I've got something to show you. Quick, I've got something to show you. And um, this is, a, you know, we had a very posh education. This tutor, his father, had drawn all the boundaries of Eastern Europe at the Treaty of Versailles. He said, we'll have Czechoslovakia here, we'll have Hungary there. <laughs> and Lloyd George said, yes, yes, of course, Professor. Yes, yes, of course. That's one of the reasons all that came into existence. 
and Christopher came right and said, Rifkin, come. And he took this photograph. He had it in Life magazine or Paris Match, whatever we used to read. And he said, look at him, look at him. Look, he said, look at that double cuff. Look at that cuff link. <laughs> he said, this is in 1964. And Christopher said to me, look at that, Rifkin. He said, the revolution's over. <laughs> and so I knew I was part of it. I knew I was part of it because that's my shirt and my cuff link. And I had them then, and I have them now. So I was a running dog. I was a collaborator. I was an unreliable element. I was the petty bourgeois putrefaction of the desire for communism. And I still loved the cufflinks. I loved the shirt. But I hated Brezhnev. <laughs> I love St. Augustine, too. It's another position. How do you do it? It's very, very hard to get it. Gorky recorded Lenin's very characteristic words spoken after he list Give up. I'll give it to you another time. But those are the things I can't split from. Those are the things that hold me back. Those are the things that come between you. Ah, Brezhnev, the rat. Here was a running dog. <laughs> And in the background, it was still there. The Appassionata. Did Brezhnev love the Appassionata like Lenin? You bet he didn't. He'd probably never even heard of it. The lackey, the petty bourgeois putrefaction of the communist movement. The end of the revolution began before I even knew about its beginning. But those are the fragments I love, I've learned to love, and will. <laughs> and in that process, who am I? Yes, one of you said it this afternoon. You talk about yourself, the more you talk about yourself. He didn't say quite that. He said that if you tear apart the self, you find little by little all the structures that produce it. So I spent some time when I was preparing this, and I lay like this, and imagined that I was the revolution lying like that. And what would it be like for people to say, it's dead, it's gone, to put myself in the... And then I spent some time doing that, which is what I learned to do as a teacher. And then back there, and there, and after that slowly emerges the tearing again, the tearing but in a new form, the tearing between being the forensic master and being part of the corpse of one's own hopes and the hopes that preceded one. That was something, too, that I thought. And I got that from Rembrandt, who actually is an artist I hate. <laughs> no trouble separating from Rembrandt. And I got it from that, too, from St. Augustine, looking up and down in this impasse of what is vertical and what is horizontal. Doesn't that tell you how to be lost in one's thought? And then St. Sebastian, too, because after all, he's a great gay hero, and I, I lay in that position, too. And I imagine would, if that was the revolution and it was plucked out of me, how would I feel? Would I want to be the person who plucked it? No. She's a lady saint. I didn't want to be a lady saint. And then maybe it began or maybe it finished here with me, with my un unerring love of Ingrid Bergman, who 
in this film where she plays Anastasia, death to the Tsars, death to the Russian monarchy, long live 1905, long live 1907. But there's Ingrid Bergman pretending to be Anastasia, and from her, we all learned how to carry a handbag. <laughs> what do you do? This is another split, this is another tearing. And at the same time, there was Khrushchev with his shoe. The same year as Ingrid was carrying handbags, Khrushchev was hitting the, hitting the podium with his shoe. He wasn't like a nice professor with his scissors or his tweezers and his bang, 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 putting an end to the area of Stalin. And I had a colleague <coughs> who could never look at this photograph because she loved Stalin. She loved Stalin because she was a little girl in Poland and she said to me, Every morning, we would dance one of Chopin's polonaise in front of Stalin's portrait. And we would... Dum, da, dum, da, 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 dum, da, dum. Every morning she did that, and she said, I love that more than anything in my life, and I will always love Stalin because of that. He means my childhood to me. Whatever you tell me. Dum, da, dum. <laughs> oh. No, and then, then that, that's another thing too, you see, and another tearing. And I want to say something about great porticos, I want to say something about great buildings, because in our bourgeois life we admire the enormous buildings, and we know that in the Russian Revolution those great buildings, those vast porticos of St. Petersburg were preserved. They became the home of new kinds of museums, of new kinds of civic, new kinds of national capital organizations of the Soviets. It was in St. Petersburg through those buildings, the builders of which they sought to destroy and they destroyed. It was those buildings which in a sense represented a grandeur from which we could never separate and to which we wanted to return. And it's the same thing. I go through these postures of the revolutionary operas. I go through the moments in which they occurred to me, which I saw them. I try it. I try it. I try to receive the insult, which is kind of what you do if you're into a certain kind of gay identity politics, and I wait to be struck. But people don't get the pleasure of sometimes being struck in that way, or defeating the strike. Let's carry on. You see, you can't get away from it. And then who's this? Who is it? It's Eisenstein. It's from an Eisenstein film. And I knew how hopelessly I'd got things over. That I was everything that everyone said was bad about a fellow traveler. So I was an unreliable, putrid, petty bourgeois, homosexual fellow traveler of the future, eventual, perhaps, purity of the working class. Where was I to stand? I liked Eisenstein because of that. I thought he was cute. It's hopeless. Vast porticos, vast porticos. The Russian National Library, the Manchester Central Library, almost contemporaneous buildings. Yes, the Manchester Central Library, and why not? Because in the Manchester Central Library, as a teenager, I discovered that. Yes, I discovered that. I went to a cinema club there, underage, but with my mum, whom I also loved, and we saw movies. Oh, that's the Manchester Central Library I put Cornelius Cardew in, just to show that the solidarity we had could be projected back into this misty past of vast porticos. Long live the Communist Party of England, Marxist-Leninist. Long live Cornelius Music. There you are. I've said it. And in that library, there's the library, there's a 60 millimeter projector, and there's another Russian National Library. I saw those two films, Battleship Potemkin and Les Enfants du Paradis. And because of the clicking of the 16 millimeter projector, and because I was very young and naive, I thought they were the same kind of film, and I ought to pay them the same kind of attention. So you might say, my love of the revolution and my love of the working class were well, nothing to do with the revolution or the working class, but my love of the 16 millimeter projector, the thing that goes click, 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 clack, click, clack, click, clack, through the gate and snaps from time to time. 
and then you get out your little editing machine, you stick the film together and play it again. That was how it worked. That's how I learnt about Le Peuple and the Knights of the Proletariat. Those are the little short evenings of Adrian Rifkin. So that when the moment came and they took him down and floated him down the river, I wept. And I tried to adopt all those positions. And even running away from it all, like St. Jerome's monks and the lion, I tried to run away from them all. It's a mess. <laughs> Jetzt hast du die Macht prolet, deine Faust schreibt das Gesetz und die rote Fahne wird auf dem Haus des Staats auf jetzt. Cherry time. How could I outlive them both? I don't know. I don't know. I thought, let's just get rid of it all now. There's Freud. He stays because he taught us you can't have what you desire. There's my mother. She can go. There's Elizabeth Dmitriev, the leader of the women's organization of the Paris Commune, who was lost by the Russian Revolution. No one knows how, but they lost her. She was the greatest of communards and they kind of lost her. She was a petty bourgeois, a decaying element, I think. So let's get rid of her. Eisenstein, a good homosexual, let's keep him. <laughs> Marcel Carnet, is on another good homosexual, let's keep him. Warren Beatty is a straight fool, let's get rid of him. <laughs> ah, there's Karl Einstein. Let's keep him. Let's keep him. You know, in the, in, 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 the, in the Spartacus uprising, he could have shot Ernst Kantarevich because they were on opposite sides of the barricade. And if he'd shot Ernst Kantarevich, the Germans would never have had the myth of the ruling emperor, Frederick II Hohenstaufen, and maybe communism would have survived. So because he didn't shoot Kantarevich. No, no, let's, I don't know, no, let's just put it out. Listen. I think I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I just want to show that something is real. The click, click, click of primitive technology that introduces us to our love of revolutionary things, or in my case, in my case did, the thing which was more important altogether than the content of Battleship Potemkin was the clicking of the machine. But no, let's not. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go back a revolution. I'm going to go back to 1848, something I thought I'd forgotten. Because what we're talking about, I think, is love, is solidarity, is the impossibility of love in the postponement of the revolution, problems of class and class longing and class desire and longing to be the working class and longing to be St. Teresa of Avila and all these things at once. So I, I thought just before I started talking, to, I'll go back to Pierre Dupont. I'll go back to the great Chant des Ouvriers of 1848. And I can't sing, but I'll sing it for you. But it goes like this. And then I'll, it goes like this, the chorus. Aimons-nous, et qu'on nous pouvons nous unir pour boire à la ronde, que le canon se taise ou gronde, buvons, buvons, Buvons. And now I forget the words. Buvons, buvons, buvons. Alas, something rather du monde. 